I hate health potions. One of the consistent relics of modern gaming, an artifact and inventory item that players invariably ask for and have determined that they need is the health potion. In this episode, I would like to talk about why health potions are the worst thing since sliced bread. Now that I've gotten that out of my system, I'm actually a really big fan of sliced bread. I should probably come up with a, a different moniker and edit that in later. But health potions are a detriment to the game for a plethora of reasons. I'm going to cover at least three in this episode. First, I want to talk a little bit about health potions and how they short circuit the experience of the dungeon delve as intended in the game. Two. I want to talk about the cleric archetype and how health potions represent the worst of what clerics have become. And three, I want to talk about levels of magic, levels of capability, and verisimilitude in a campaign milieu, and how health potions can screw it up. So if it didn't come off in the initial bit for this episode. I was in a bit of a bad mood while I was driving there, and eh, it may have colored my language a little bit. So, if that came off as a little intense, well, we'll just pretend that I was camping. In the meantime, uh, in a more calm state of mind, I'd like to talk about how health potions took the core of the game, ruined it forever, spat on both Dave and Gary's graves, and corrupted a generation of youth. At its heart, the game is a strategy game, which then results in the emergence of a narrative. While I cannot speak for original gaming, as I wasn't there, I can speak to OSR gaming, and in the OSR experience, this is what you're aiming for. The OSR is not original gaming. It is instead a recreation of an idealized play style. You can play AD&D without being OSR, you can play D&D with being OSR, but that's a subject for another time. When we're talking about the contemporary understanding of what the game constitutes, at its heart is strategy. But Taylor, my strategy is to bring a boatload of health potions. On the contrary, by introducing those potions, a dungeon master risks short-circuiting the biggest parts of the game. Combat in BX takes up eh, maybe a, a fifth of the B book, and then X is about exploration and strongholds. So, when you're talking about the two of them together, a tiny fraction is devoted to combat. When you make healing accessible, when you make healing easy, and, well, I'll take that back. When you make healing easily accessible in a dungeon context, you in discourage creative solutions, you discourage creative thinking, and you enable powering through rather than coming up with a clever option. Say your party comes across a group of trolls. They could charge in, beat them into unconsciousness through brute force, and then dissolve the bodies in acid. Or they could lure the trolls into a narrower hallway that they had pre-coated with greased oil. They can then light that on fire. The trolls immolate, are trapped in the flames, and the party moves through with the exact same end accomplished. Now, that is totally to ignore the possibility of a positive reaction with the troll, but I wanted to express a specific point. Combat doesn't necessarily mean charging in and beating face. Combat can be strategic. Combat can be a game in and of itself. 
if you play the game correctly, if you use the environment to your advantage, it becomes a lot more of a challenge and a lot more of a reward from the perspective of a player. So if I'm telling a story and I talk about, oh yeah, I rolled really hot and I beat the crap out of something, I didn't accomplish that. That was chance. That was the dice. But if I mention that I threw a clever stratagem, overcame something with minimal loss to myself, or overcame something that I shouldn't have overcome. That is the experience we're driving for. Health potions enter into this because they actively discourage the latter solution by empowering the former. It requires no thought to charge in and beat face. It requires significant thought to come up with alternative strategies to revisit your map, to figure out how you're going to pin the trolls in, and so on. Health potions are a way for the party to get out of having made mediocre or even bad decisions and come out on the lucky end. Suddenly, it no longer matters that I fell into a pit trap and didn't die, I only lost d6 hit points. Boop, I'm back up. I no longer really have to look for traps, because unless they're instant death, abundant healing allows me to simply walk through it and ignore. If I am going into the wilderness, uh, and fighting large numbers of adversaries trying to carve out my domain, abundance of healing means that I don't have to be tactful. I can just waltz in and we can whip out our Warhammer armies, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with points values, and not worry about the casualties, presuming that the neighborhood cleric and apothecary has put them back together. As such, the inclusion of health potions takes one-fifth of the material and takes over 90% of the game. As a byproduct, it takes away from the player experience, short-circuiting that other four-fifths. And that brings us to the bastardized archetype that is the cleric. We talk about easy access to healing, and the first thing people go to is well, you better have a cleric in the party. If you don't have a cleric, then uh, you're going to want to bring some health potions. When, if you look at the numbers, that's factually mistaken. In newer editions, I believe the turning point was probably 3.0, when Watsi took over and kind of transitioned. To their credit, the designers at the time did want to take the game, quote, back into the dungeon. But they did so in an action RPG, not the classic exploration and treasure hunter sword and sorcery RPG. But I'm getting off track. We look at the cleric from OD&D, from BX, from Beckme, from AD&D, and I'm pretty sure second edition truthfully follows the same suit with their version of the cleric. I do not own the second edition book, so I cannot vouch for it. But the fir at first level, the Acolyte doesn't get a spell. You can bring a Cleric or you don't bring a Cleric. It doesn't matter. You don't get that healing spell. What you do get is a character with the same two-hit and armor proficiencies as your fighter, who probably can't wield a sword, so it's just a slightly crappier fighter who's going to advance a little quicker. But the point is, you don't heal anybody until level two. Similarly, when you finally do get that healing spell, 1200 XP later, you get one. And it's competing against other spells. Your first level spell slot is competing with light. In old school editions, you can use light to blind a target enemy for the duration. That's an encounter ender right there. Take that guy out of the fight. You're competing with protection from evil. What's that? I'm personally immune to melee from characters of another alignment, so long as I don't strike them. Again, major game changer. Remove fear, or reverse, cause it. Cause fear. You, you are no longer in this fight. You're fleeing. You for turns. You're gone. Or, you feared me? Uh-uh. My ally here is right back in you. I have nullified your advantage, my Mr. Fear Monster. The Cleric is not a heal bot at low level or mid-level in an OSR context. The Cleric doesn't get Cure Serious Wounds, the upgrade from Cure Light, all the way until they can access 4th level spells. 
And at fourth level spell, you're competing in that memorization slot against neutralized poison. What's that? The thief tripped the trap and is dropped dead? Just kidding, he's back. That is an encounter changer. That is an exploration changer that takes something that was a threat before. Now, all of a sudden, it's no longer a threat. I would much rather be brought back from the dead from a poison needle uh, or a viper or a spider or any number of poison inflicting creatures than I would to regain 2d6 plus 2 hit points. At the same time, you're competing against protection from evil 10 foot radius. I saved an entire party from ghouls with protection from evil, 10 foot radius. There was a swarm of the suckers, but we retreated up into a hallway that was uh, 10 or 15 feet wide, and I cast that spell. They could not pursue us beyond that point. Protection from evil, 10 foot radius. Party saver. Cure moderate runes? Eh. You bring that one guy back from the ghoul touch. This episode of Cleric's Way Ringmail is brought to you by Tale of the Manticore. Tale of the Manticore. That's where the spikes are. Are you looking for a D&D podcast with a dark side? Something more like Game of Thrones and less like Monty Python? Tale of the Manticore is part dark fantasy audio drama, part solo D&D RPG. There's no plot armor here. The dice make all the important decisions. Join me as I resurrect the excitement, wonder, and emotion of old-school D&D. Made for a mature audience, Tale of the Manticore is both a fiction and a game. It's the story where chaos rolls. To pound the point home... Oh man, it's a nice day outside. I'm recording while I walk. I'm just doing a quick loop around the neighborhood while the boys are asleep. It is a balmy 60-65. I've got my jacket and shorts on, and I can hear the wind in the trees. I've got a lot to be thankful for. But that's another podcast. Think about when the cleric gets Cure Serious Wounds. They get it at 6th level, when they are able to access 4th level spells. Now, at 6th level, the cleric still only has two 1st level spell slots, so at a maximum, they're going to be healing two Cure Lights and one Cure Moderate, or 4d6 plus 4 hit points. At the same level of experience, the party fighter is going to be 5th level, and they're going to have 5d8 hit points. And usually, I mean, who plays a fighter without a con mod? The fighter's going to have 5d8 plus a bonus. So, if you get into a tussle and you need that healing, The cleric who has devoted their entire arsenal to being the party heal bot, they are only going to be able to heal the one fighter part of the way. So, the cleric itself does not mechanically support the idea of the heal bot or the class's access to easy dungeon healing. So, where does the heal bot idea come from? Arguably, it comes from 3rd edition. Did I already say this? Maybe. But the point is, in trying to take it back to the dungeon, the uh, Wizards of the Coast 3rd Edition bastardized the concept of what a cleric was supposed to be. When, in the original game, the designers had the Van Helsing character in mind. They had the picture of Peter Cushing holding a cross and uh, keeping Dracula, Christopher, what's his name? Keeping Dracula at bay. As such, the cleric in D&D has a lot of powers, but most of them center around utility. It can heal, but that's not the purpose of the class. You you are a supplemental fighter, you are a support caster, and you are an undead repellent. Take that, Sir Fang. So I rant about that to rant about this. Healing potion culture was produced by a misinterpretation of playstyle, a replacement of exploration with action. 
and by sacrificing the purpose and soul of the cleric to promote that mistaken play style, which in turn perpetuates itself. The more healing you have, the more combat focused the game becomes, and the more combat you have, the greater need for healing. So you run into the situation where the cleric is now not a man of the cloth, not a foe to entropy. They are a healer, and they have studied the art of healing. They may be a physician. This came up in a game I played uh, ooh, maybe a year or two now ago, where one of our one of our party members had succumbed to a save versus poison, and as a cleric, I quote might know. Uh, something about neutralizing it. I did not have the spell, I did not have the ability, but we searched around and we found a sort of king's foil on the ground, and with that king's foil we were able to afford the other player a another save. He failed the save and died, but that's not the point. The point is there's a cultural expectation for the cleric to be a healer. And while I think that particular story is a good example of player skill, uh, it was a good example of trying to use the environment we were in to our advantage and being creative with our solutions. Um, and on top of that, a fairly generous uh, referee. We still suffered from the same fundamental shift. We did interpret the archetype differently than what the creators of the game had in mind, and what, and we may have interpreted it in a way that produced a different experience than the one for which the game was probably intended. I'll take a moment to include the obligatory, Did we have fun? Yes, then we didn't do anything wrong. It's not my intent nor my place to tell you that you're playing a game wrong if you and your table are enjoying it, but it is my place to tell you that clerics are capable of being so much more. Clerics as a roleplay opportunity are so much bigger than the guy who can patch you back together. And I think that's where I was going with this rant, is healing potion culture leads to a bastardization of what the cleric stands for, and you're unable to run the cleric in a way that was consistent with the archetype. Which is where the third edition paladin came from. The cleric should have been what the paladin was. The crusader, the healer, the supplemental fighter. But instead, Third edition gave us the unstoppable death cleric. But again, that is a conversation for another time. I'm now about a mile, mile and a half into my walk, and I'm in such a good mood. I should hold off until I have to go to work for a few days to finish this episode, uh, but I'm going to power through. How much magic is too much magic? D&D, at its heart, has never been a low magic game. There's always been phenomenal treasure and power in the underworld. However, a lot of the fiction that it claims to be inspired by, the Conans of the world, the Farfads and Grey Mausers, that fiction contains only passing references to magic. Magic is something that the bad guy uses, something that the protagonist has to overcome. Magic is not something that infuses your day-to-day -day life. Now, if my cleric character gets killed and I reroll with a decent wisdom, boom, another cleric has joined the party. With that in mind, you can never really claim that the D&D &D is low magic because there's apparently an endless supply of magic users I won't clerics to be specific, but the same applies if my wizard gets capped. I can just re-roll them, and there he is. So, D&D, &D in general, access to magic has always been there, and it's always been a thing. But one of the things that a lot of DMs like to kind of dive into is the grim, uh, verisimilitudinous world. Now, 
I don't know if that's a real word or not, but I use it. The point is, you have these fantastic treasures and amazing wealth under the ground, and you have this endless supply of, of magic, but then you still have people dying of dysentery. That doesn't really make sense when you have the heal bot cleric and heal potion culture. If a healing potion is only eh, 50 to 100 gold pieces, if it is something that is cheap enough to be easily in reach of a first level party or a second level party, why can't communities have it? You'd think that, uh, I don't know, a town of 100 commoners would be able to come up with 50 gold pieces. And this ties in to the original cleric archetype. Yes, they did have the ability to remove disease. However, removing disease was a third level spell. You didn't get that for a long time, and it makes sense. Your local leader, your local spirit leader, they aren't going to be able to cast that particular spell. They're not going to be able to invoke that miracle. Similarly, your local acolyte, they may not be able to do a damn thing. They'll pray with you. As it is presented, a lower magic setting preserves that kind of believability of how the environment is set up. People can still die of dysentery when there's no easily accessible magical cure. It reinforces the sort of class structure because the king or the, the local lord, they're going to be able to afford the third level spell to come in and make short work of that illness. But your layman's aren't necessarily going to. And having potions that short circuit that element of world building, it likewise forces you in the interest of keeping a consistent tone to change how the world interacts. More magic implies that there's going to be more access to magic and people are going to be using magic for things that in a traditional setting you may use manual labor for. Some settings have leaned wholly into this. You have your Magitech or your Zeppelins powered by lightning and that's a kick-ass concept. I myself have a homebrew that's like that. I've never run a game in that homebrew world. It was more of a masturbatory exercise because the games that I run, I enjoy that sword and sorcery feel. I enjoy having magic be a scarce resource. And as a byproduct, the world that I want to run my games in has to be consistent with that tone. Otherwise, I kind of find myself falling off the wagon. And I am back, back at my desk, editing the episode that comes out probably just before this one. From here, that about sums up my thoughts on health potions and why I think that just like any magic item, they will change the game. And just like any magic item, you should be very careful before introducing them, and especially careful when introducing them in excess. With that in mind, main topic concluded. We'll move into some calls and call it a day. Dude, I will hug you so hard if we ever meet, man. You have no idea. I will hug you so hard. That's rad that you and Carl got a chance to kick it for a little while. That's just so cool. What's up with that waitress, man? <laughs> she seeing anybody? Let me know. Let me know. Oh, dude. Anyway, that was an amazing review slash deep dive slash overview of, <laughs> I think, Fate Accelerated. I loved every part of it. Uh, I love the character you made. It was just fantastic. I'm not even going to give you a hard time about how you talk about in OSR games. If you narrate in a way that sounds good, your chances for success increase. But later on, you hold it up as a negative that if you're good at narration, you get an advantage. Like, I, that's fine, man. <laughs> it's all good. Anyway, great stuff. Peace out. You heard it here first. RichterCon 2020X. Hugs will be at the door. And yes, that was my attempted deep dive into the Fate Accelerated Edition. I am glad it jived for you, but come to think of it, I probably should have been a little more uh, clear <laughs> when I was talking about the narration element. So, to speak to that point, can using player skill slash action narration role-playing through a problem be a problem in OSR games for the same reason? 
That is, if I'm a charismatic person, I can have a charismatic character and a successful character regardless of whether my ideas are good ones or not. Yes, it can. So, why did I harp on it in one instance and praise it in another? The difference is the framework around mechanical resolution. With BX or other OSR style games, you do have an element of player skill influencing your chances of success. However, that player skill is in the context of the hard mechanics of the system. For example, we'll pick on thieves. Everyone likes to pick on thieves in uh, OSR style games because of their appallingly small percentile chances to succeed at thiefy tasks, say, picking a lock. The player skill aspect is not describing with flourish about how you manipulate the tumblers. The player skill aspect is not the referee throwing an antique lock onto the table and telling the player, go for it. The player skill aspect is bringing along that vial of acid or the little pouch you have at home with the severed antenna of a rust monster so that you can stuff those into the lock, melting the internals of it and getting through if your lockpicking attempt fails. The player skill aspect is drawing a map as you explore and, based on that map, looking, if there's a door you can't get through, for a loop, looking for an alternate way to get to the same area or objective that the current impediment is blocking. With Fate, reading through the book, that same mechanical framework, that parachute, so to speak, wasn't there. Your approach to use the term used in the book, determined how the dice looked. So if you were being careful about it, if you were being forceful about it, that determined what kind of dice you rolled. And the way you negotiated what you were doing with the referee is what allowed them to determine what the level of difficulty was. For BX, a thief may have a base 15% chance of unlocking that lock, but in Fate Accelerated, the same thief, you don't have a base chance. You have a negotiation. And when you don't have that mechanical framework to fall back on, that's when the seatbelt comes off. Uh, you don't have a natural defense against the charismatic player taking over the action. Now, there are exceptions to that statement. Combat comes to mind. Uh, you're rolling against your opponent in that case when using the Fate system. And since receiving the book, I have not played a game with it, nor have I gone online to seek out an actual play, which is my typical modus operandi to figure out how a game runs. So I present this less as an argument and more as a clarification of my position. And someone out there who has played the game, who has experience with it, feel free to call in and tell me I'm wrong. But to synopsize, the difference for me is how peripheral or how involved the narrative element is to task resolution. And thank you very much. Uh, that is, of course, Joe Richter of Hindsightless. Thank you for calling in. Uh, really, That really tickled me. I was very excited. I was very happy that the episode spoke to you like it did. So if nothing else, you put a smile on my face as I listened to the anchor message in the car. Again, thank you for calling in. I enjoy hearing your voice. And I actually owe you another call in. Uh, you had sent me one a while back that got me excited, and I've recorded about 20 minutes of response to. So that'll be coming down the pipeline, hopefully soonish, but we'll see where we go. Hey, Taylor. Uh, thanks for the shout out and your review of Fate Accelerated. I have Fate Accelerated, I think, somewhere, and Fate Core, and I have played Fate before. I played, um, have I played it? I ran for some friends a game called uh, The Secret of Cats, where cats are sorcerers, and my wife really enjoyed it. She loves cats, and she keeps reminding me that we need to play Cthulhu at some point. Um, so I think the other players got a kick out of it. There are a couple players there that really kind of approached it from a more gamist and board game point of view, and they kind of saved all their plus twos, like for the big ending 
kaboom, uh, which I guess is okay. Um, you can do that. But um, I couldn't tell if the other players appreciated that. I know that there is a supplement that you can not just play a cat, but dogs and rats and stuff like that. It was a pretty fun little product. I mean, it was kind of like cats save the day because they're, I think they're humans. I got, or there are some missing children and the cats uh, had an idea where they were and they saved them from some sort of ghost. Um, that was pretty interesting little adventure. And they have like, they had like a little neighborhood in there and how cats interact like you could be like a house cat or a tom cat and it's kind of neat um little game so um the the game i'd like to get to the table fate wise is a game called mind jammer and they have a traveler version and a fate version and i think it really does um fate lends itself well to like a crazy distant future sci-fi i think there you have it, folks. I promised to have Carl on my next episode, and there he was. Woohoo! I'm just kidding. I am still trying to get Carl on the show. Carl is working with me and my absurd schedule, and we're trying to figure it out, but it has proven a challenge uh, in part because of the holidays and in part because we are uh, both adults with adult things going on. It will happen. Uh, we just may, may be a couple episodes out. To speak to your commentary on fate, uh, I think your gamist players are coming at it from the same perspective I probably was while I was reading the book. I find that when I'm playing in a game where I have less uh, adventure stuff and more talky stuff, it just kind of, I'm not sure I kind of, z I zone out, I just, I guess I'm not a natural thespian and I'm not drawn to that style of play. That's not to say it doesn't have its place and it's not to say I haven't done it before. It's just something I don't really have time to really devote to it uh, with my once a financial quarter gaming schedule these days. Talking about Cthulhu, oh man break out that Fithagen feast and Amy is on the right track. I would play in a Cthulhu game in a heartbeat. I am curious what the skill list would look like for a cat version. Hmm. And I'm really realizing, I think I left a message on Jason Connerly's podcast that I am I don't have I have like one sci fi game right now and a lot of it is all fantasy. Maybe there's some modern type of horror games, um and I need some more sci fi. But I'm excited. I I might, you know, to touch the OSR type of nerve, I might run some mothership at some point. Um I just the, the Kickstarters right now is going and I just read like it hit one million dollars for like an indie game that's pretty damn incredible and I liked Mothership a lot when I played it um, so uh, yeah it'd be kind of neat to run uh, an oh, oh Star Frontiers has been bandied about uh, but my wife just got me this uh, Lost Colony Savage Worlds like it's like Deadlands in the future um and uh kind of sounds neat too so oh man mothership i have not played a game of mothership i have some friends who play mothership but yeah a million dollar kickstarter i want to say it went even higher too that's that was a shock to me i mean i knew it was out there and i knew it was big but i had no idea it was that big that's like oh i don't think uh, old school essentials even made it to a million hats off to uh, gavin and my system of choice there of the games you are presenting, I kind of like the Deadlands in Space description. I have not played the actual game or setting that you're talking about, but I remember Deadlands is one of those games that I always wanted to run but never had a chance to. I loved Deadlands because it was a new take on the Wild West, a sort of weird West, and throwing it into space, oh man, that's like Cthulhu meets Firefly. Whew, I got the jitters. I'm gonna have to run a game myself. You got my creative juices flowing. Thank you, Carl, uh, for the message, and thank you for calling in. Uh, be on the lookout. I will reach out to you. We'll figure out a time, and we will get that episode out there. In the meantime, hmm, what is the sci-fi equivalent of a delve? I'm going to have to update my catchphrase if I ever start playing Traveler. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. Um, 
I tell you what, this is Randy from Biggest Geekus. Uh, loved your review of Fate. I thought you took it in stride. I thought you did a good job, actually. I was impressed. You took the time to review it. Um, anyway, uh, love your boys. They are awesome. I would say keep them in your podcast when you can, though. I know they're a lot to wrangle. Um, hope you guys uh, have a very nice Thanksgiving. Take care. Talk to you soon. Happy retrospective Thanksgiving right back at you, Randy, and a uh, happy Christmas going forward. Uh, we spent the Thanksgiving holiday at my uncle's house. Uh, he does not have children, uh, just two big dogs. The boys enjoyed being around the dogs, and I only had two heart attacks as they wandered around his non-baby-proofed house full of expensive things. I do, uh, in terms of the fate system, I'm very glad that folks seem to enjoy it and uh, that my walkthrough wasn't too silly, but... Um, it is my lowest rated episode to date, and uh, Anchor tells me my estimated listenership has been cut in half <laughs> since my uh, call-in episode where I featured exclusively Daniel Norton of Bandit's Keep, so apparently I just need to get him on the show more. Eh. Well, I digress. Uh, I bill myself as an OSR guy, but that doesn't mean that I can't look at other systems for some inspiration. I have some fond memories of 3E, I have some fond memories of a bunch of Mongoose games. A friend of mine in college was a big Mongoose guy. And mm, you, what, you, what you do is you take those systems, you take the pieces that work that you like, and try to backfuse them into your home table somehow. Now, now that I have gone through the Fate Core book, or the Fate Accelerated book, my mistake, I just have to figure out what to do with it. Anyway, thank you very much for calling in, and indeed, I will speak to you soon. So, I said I would call it a day after the call-ins, and the call-ins have been called, so a day it must be. Delvon, everybody, a signing off for today. This is Taylor of Cleric Swear Ringmail, along with my co-host, Baby Micah. Baby Micah, do you want to say bye-bye? Bye-bye. Theme music used for the Clerics Wearing Mail podcast is adapted from Pursuing Darkness by artist X Take Rocks, released into the public domain and made available on freemusicarchive.org. Sound effects used in the making of this product retrieved from mixkit.co, used under the Mixkit sound effects free license, or from soundj.com and used in accordance with the soundj.com terms of use. Segments recorded within a vehicle are recorded using a Bluetooth hands-free device in conjunction with local vehicular safety legislation. The Clerics Wearing Mail podcast is an independently owned and operated product released for educational and informative purposes under the Totally Steal This license, which is kind of like Creative Commons except for licensing. Clerics Wearing Mail does not ascribe to nor endorse views or opinions expressed by Collins guests or even the host unless you think they're awesome, and thus does not assume any liability regarding the consumption or distribution of this podcast. By listening to the Clerics Wearing Mail podcast, you agree to the provided term. Parties with questions regarding these terms, conditions, or Releases are encouraged to reach out to Clerics Wearing Mail at the prescribed methods provided on the Clerics Wearing Mail blog. Parties dissatisfied with these terms, conditions, or releases are encouraged to go suck an egg.